Shalom everyone, this is Amir Tsarfati and I am here finally live from Galilee. This is the first time I'm live from an office that we finally managed to acquire uh, and not from my home. Uh, it uh, became a little bit uh, impossible with the slow internet and uh, the packed house to be able to do those things from there. So we've been working for the last three weeks on the new office. Uh, first home ever for Behold Israel to have an office. And now uh, we are broadcasting from there. We hope and pray that the picture quality and the sound quality are much better than what we had before. Together with me today is Pastor Mark uh, Hitchcock, and I'm going to bring him on the screen with me right now. Pastor Mark, shalom. Uh, shalom. Uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, our uh, Middle East update. Uh, Pastor Mark, uh, allow me to say a few words of introduction to people. Um, I know that you are well known. You, you, you know, as someone who wrote more than thirty books with the, who are sold uh, over one uh, million copies. Uh, you are well known. But Mark, you were born in Oklahoma City. You attended the Oklahoma State University. You graduated from the law school in 1984. You worked as a uh, assist for a judge uh, at the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals for four years, and then uh, you were led uh, to uh, go to Dallas Theological Seminary. And after graduating there, 1991, you served since then as the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. As a, again, you uh, also completed your PhD at Dallas Theological Seminary. In 2005, and you serve as an associate professor of Bible exposition at DTS. Uh, you authored over 30 books uh, related mostly to end-time Bible prophecy that have sold over 1 million copies. Unbelievable. Uh, your books have been translated into over 10 languages. You're frequent speakers at churches and prophecy conferences, both in the United States and internationally. You and Cheryl, your wife, you have two sons, Justin, who is married to Natalie, and Samuel, and you've got two grandchildren. Mark, I hope I said everything. Well, I've actually got three grandchildren now. That's the only thing, and that's what I'm most proud of is my grandchildren. So, Wonderful. Yes. Well, no, need to update the website then. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for that kind introduction, yeah. Well, Mark, we know each other for quite a few years. I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, as a tour guide, I guided your uh, group in 20, uh, 2006, uh, am I right? Yes. That's right, yes, yeah. yes, we've known each other for 13 years, yes. Exactly, and, um, and I also think that both of us share the pulpit in more than one uh, prophecy conference uh, in the United States. Right, yes, we've had the privilege to do that some, yeah, especially at Jan Markell's conference, the Marking the Times conference, so... Yeah, it's always good to see him. We just saw each other a little about a month ago, a little over a month ago at Nof Genesar there up in exactly. Galilee, where you are. Yeah, so, yes. you you actually you brought a two bus tour. I think I also had a, a tour that is, or one bus, but it was a full bus if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And I also had one at the time, and um, that these were the last tour groups in Israel. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, a week later. Tourism literally came to a standstill in Israel. Am I right? That's right. I mean, I think we're we're one of the last groups out. I mean, I know a group that just had gotten there was having to leave um, right at about the time we were. So people's flights were being all changed at, at the end and pretty chaotic getting out of there. But uh, but the last day or two of touring was really nice. There was hardly anybody around. Exactly. I mean, you don't want to do it under those conditions. But uh, no, it was. It was uh, really, really a strange time to be there. Very eerie as the streets of Jerusalem were starting Very to end. I, I, I totally agree with you. But we also have to agree that Israel has never been so beautiful. I mean, oh. it, it, it was so green and the Sea of Galilee was so full of water. When was the last time you saw it that way? That way it was, well, we've yeah. been, you know, two years before, but it was, yeah, the rain that they've had there has just made it so much more green and lush and the Sea of Galilee's full. So it was a great time to be there. Our people loved being there. It was just that those last couple of days, there started to be a lot of fear among people uh, with, all, with all, that's been, all that was going on. Yes. And then, uh, to the best of my knowledge, at that time, 
the fear among your people and among others in Israel was uh, about the virus arriving in Israel. That was before it hit hard uh, New York City and the rest of the United States continent. Am I right? No, that's right. It was just kind of beginning to, you know, beginning to spread a bit in, in, in America and they'd shut down, you know, travel from China. And then while we were over there, right near the end, Trump shut down travel, President Trump shut down travel from Europe. So, yeah, when we got back, I mean, it, it was weird. We left and we came back and we came back to a new world. It was, exactly. we were kind of in a bubble over there in Israel, kind of while we were doing our tour. We come back, it, it was a new world. We haven't had church services since we've been back been preaching to an empty, empty room and live street. So, you know, the, the words, I think we've used the word strange, weird, unprecedented, uh, surreal. I've heard those words used about a thousand times, but we've kind of run out of adjectives really to describe it. Yeah, our world has definitely changed and it seems like it'll never be back uh, the same way it was. Um, let's talk for a few minutes, Mark, before, before we go into the uh, update, um, would you do us a favor or an honor and uh, start this update with a prayer. Yes, I'll be glad to. Father, we do thank you for uh, this day that you've given to each one of us, Lord. We we thank you so much for your blessings to us. We thank you for the health that each one of us enjoy, the measure of health from your hand. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this technology that uh, enables us to talk from very far distances to, to many, many people. I'm um, about you and about your word, and we, we appreciate so much, Lord, the privilege to, to minister today. Uh, Lord, we thank you above everything else for Jesus, our Savior, um, who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you for so great salvation, calling us out of darkness to your life. And uh, Lord, we pray that as we uh, talk today about what you're doing in the world and what your plan is for this world, uh, that the light would shine into the people's hearts and lives. We thank you for a sure word of prophecy. We have the privilege to talk about and proclaim here today. Thank you for Amir, for your blessing upon him, his family, his ministry. And uh, Lord, we just pray that your spirit will minister to us and through us uh, now together during our time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, um, let's dive into the freshest and the newest and the hottest thing that just happened a few hours ago. Uh, while you probably were asleep, Iran launched uh, the first ever military satellite um, and uh, successfully. This is probably the fifth attempt and uh, under the guise of, uh, you know, fighting the coronavirus and having to deal with so many other things around, I guess uh, some people dropped the ball and allowed the um, uh, North Korean made launching vehicle to roll into the desert and uh, their first ever military satellite to be sent uh, to orbit. Um, I know that you wrote a book about Iran and Israel. Pastor Mark, where do you see Iran going? And do you think that under the the this whole chaos of the coronavirus uh, all around the world, they're also moving ahead with their nuclear program. Well, I do. You know, I think, you know, as, as you know, and as I know as well, um, you know, Iran is a key player, obviously, in end-time prophecy. You mentioned in Ezekiel 38, verse 5, part of this coalition of nations is going to come down to Israel in the end times. Mm -hmm. And they've been hit hard by this coronavirus. Of course, again, kind of like with over in China and North Korea, we don't really know what the numbers really are probably a lot more grave than what we've been led to believe. But, you know, there, there have been a lot of problems, obviously, there and in, in other places with the, the people there, with what the regime is doing. But one of the ways to take the focus off of what the regime isn't doing, how bad things are in their country, is to create other crises or, you know, to launch a military satellite, hail that as a great development, or, you know, to have these attacks against American forces in Iraq. Um, you know, many have been wondering if you know, Iran might do something during this time even bigger to take a focus off of what's happening with coronavirus, um, to you know, strike the U.S. And, of course, we're, we're in, not in the best position right now. We've had you know, people on our, our uh, naval vessels, you know, things with coronavirus, they're having to go to port. So, you know, a lot of people have wondered if Iran isn't going to take this, all of the, what's happening as, a, as an advantage and as a kind of a, a time to strike. You know, Israel obviously is on shutdown. You know, Israel's political situation right now is unsure. So there's just a lot of uncertainty out there. And I, you know, Iran is smart enough to seize upon that, I think. And certainly mm -hmm. I think we're foolish not to believe that they're also working on their nuclear program, you know, in, in hidden ways as well uh, during this time. So this is a, 
uh, time for them kind of under the cover of darkness to do a lot of nefarious things. Which is the thing they do all the time. Uh, they they never really tell the world what they're doing. And the world is uh, very, very naive to think that when the Iranians are signing any paper uh, with you, it means anything. Uh, it, it's interesting because uh, I, I may want to show you guys all um, the image of uh, the launching of the satellite. Pay attention to the um, camera angle. Uh, okay, so I'm. Uh, there you go. You, you can see the. Oh, sorry, sorry. Here it is. Okay, pay attention to the camera angle. You don't see where you see it's very. It's blurred where the satellite actually came from. Well, uh, I have acquired. Um, I have acquired images. Um, um, of the head of the Iranian Air Force that is standing and behind him is the actual launching vehicle. The reason why they blurred it is because they didn't want to expose the fact that they have a North Korean made launching vehicle. Um, and now, of course, we know that. Speaking, by the way, of North Korea, um, you probably heard the news uh, the CNN reported that uh, U.S. intelligence is investigating reports that Kim uh, Jong-un, who, who has ruled North Korea for 10 years since his father's death, is fighting for his life after co coronary surgery. In fact, uh, from what I get, he had a, some sort of a massive heart attack uh, that followed a surgery and uh, he never really recovered. The thing is that Kathy Tor, uh, who is a reporter for MSNBC, she tweeted uh, that he underwent heart surgery and, and then um, earlier this month and is recovering at his private villa. And according to um, what she tweeted, tweeted uh, he's basically uh, fighting for his life. He's uh, brain dead. Um, we didn't really hear one word from North Korea about it. Uh, we've heard from South Korea that they don't think it's that bad, but North Korea kept quiet about it. What, what, what do you think is going on there? Well, you know, we, no one really knows. Again, these places are so secretive about what's happening. We do know that his, his sister, I guess, you know, did some official business, which you know, he would never allow that if he, if he had capacity. <laughs> He's killed other siblings and anybody else who's a rival. His children are smaller. There's really not a successor other than his sister. So she's carried out some official business. So I think that's a pretty ominous sign right there. That would be um, and again, you know, with, with the, the technology that they have, with the nuclear capability that they have, people can lash out and do crazy things in times of chaos like we're seeing in our world right now. We can seize upon that. There's a lot of bad actors out there. You have to be, I think, our, our country right now, we're probably being less vigilant. I think we've got to be more vigilant militarily to, to what's happening out there. I know you can only stretch so far, but our military's got to really look into this and make sure that all these things are, are, being, uh, are being observed. Because, again, if he is brain dead or if he dies, we also need to be looking at, okay, who's going to take over over there? And it, could this be a time when America can go in and create some kind of instability there finally over the uh, you know the rule of the, of the uh, mm. family it seems to me that um, uh, there are some countries that are waiting for America to come down to fall down to completely collapse and you I'm not sure what your opinion is but uh, for from day one my view of the coronavirus was very clear that it's a man-made virus in Wuhan and it is a part of the Chinese effort uh, to fight the U.S.-China trade deal and even more so to become the dominant power in world trade and world commerce. Um, it seems like uh, America is trying to stretch all around. I mean, there's so many things that are going on, even in the Middle East. Eight bases of American troops in Iraq are now uh, turning to only two. Six of them were evacuated over the past three weeks. Uh, many of the American troops uh, and equipment are now moving to north and northeastern Syria. Kamishli is the city and also 
Conico is the gas field over there. And it seems like America is regrouping, relocating, um, almost in a way leaving Iraq to uh, for the Iraqis. And uh, I guess somebody is trying to say we have to choose our battles. Isn't that the case? Well, I think it is. And part of it probably is, you know, we, we want to have less sites there for Iran, for these Iranian proxies to hit. Because if they do that, then we feel a need to respond. But if we're not there, then they can't hit us. And so we won't feel this need to respond because I think we're trying to avoid probably during all this corona chaos right now, probably trying to avoid getting into a conflict with Iran. So we're probably trying to kind of, you know, let, you know, make our footprint smaller in Iraq. But in so doing, you're basically, as you said, you're kind of ceding that ground basically to Iraq and ultimately to Iran and to their proxies who are going to move in there. So, yeah, during this time right now, it's an interesting, I mean, there, there's all the whole medical issues. There's all the commercial worldwide economic issues. But there's a lot of other issues involved here where, again, you kind of use an American analogy, you kind of take your eye off the ball and... Other, others are going to move into those vacuums uh, wherever they're created. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we, we talked about um, what's going on in the Middle East, um, but uh, it seems like ISIS may have lost its territory when it comes to a state, but it's still functioning very much so in, in the territory of Iraq and Syria. And even the Iraqis themselves cannot put their finger on where ISIS uh, uh, terrorists are are emerging out of when they strike, but it has become a daily. I mean, I don't report that anymore because it's almost daily attacks of ISIS on um, Iraqi forces, Syrian forces, Shiite organizations such as Hashid al-Shabi, Iranian forces, and of course, if they can hit. Uh, Americans or others, they would do the same. But it's quite amazing. They don't have any more territory, but they still fight and they are still hiding in so many different places. And even the Iraqis themselves find it very hard to locate them, to find where they are. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, an amazing thing. Um, I see that um, Turkey is also in the picture, and I know that you have your opinion about the role of Turkey in the in the whole coming Ezekiel war. Turkey right now, as you know, is hit uh, pretty hard with the coronavirus, over 10,000 people infected, over 2,500 uh, 2, dead. And uh, Erdogan is still doing his other things in Libya and in Syria and other places. What do you think about it? Well, yeah, I, I, I've taken the view for a lot of years that uh, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Togarma, four of the places that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38, if you look on a, a map of where those places were back when Ezekiel wrote about 570 BC, those are, are located in modern day Turkey. A lot of people used to take Meshach and Tubal as Moscow and Tobolsk and up in Russia. But um, if, we, if we really study um, ancient maps, that's where they were is in Turkey. And I again, actually, I, I actually agree. I agree with you on that one. Uh, I, I agree that the Russia part is the Rosh uh, coming from the north, but I do agree with you that the Mishek and Tubal is part of ancient uh, Turkey. Yes. Yeah, and Gomer, the Gomerites were the Sumerians who were from the middle part of Turkey and, and Togarmas in eastern Turkey. So, you know, it's clear that the four of the nations mentioned there are, are from Turkey. Um, it also is interesting that. The uh, Islam has its own version of Gog and Magog mentioned twice in the Quran, and it has to do with Turkey. So it's kind of interesting in their own version of it. But yeah, they're they're involved in, in Libya. Of course, they're you know they're they're uh, trying to get a corridor along the northern part of Syria, where where, uh, where they and Russia really have control. Um, you know, I think they're going to be one of the key players. I think Russia and Turkey and Iran are the real three key players in Ezekiel 38. But it is interesting. They're they're very involved in Libya. Libya is also mentioned, I think. It's exactly. A put, um, ancient put. Um, in fact, some of the translations even have the word Libya there. But uh, Libuais or put. So, um, you know, all the, it, the these nations are, are forming alliances with one another. 
Um, again, we don't see the full-blown coalition yet of Gog, Magog, Ezekiel 38, 39, but all the key players are in place, and there's to some degree or another, alliances are being formed uh, between them. And we don't know what twists and turns they'll be in the future, but when the time comes, the alliance that's spoken of there in Ezekiel 38 will come together uh, to come against the land of Israel, and, and Turkey will play a key role in that. Yes, and uh, do you agree with me? Uh, and now we're moving now to the plunging oil prices. Uh, do you agree with me uh, that uh, the hook in the jaws of Rosh and the entire uh, reason why Russia to begin with is going to spearhead this attack is indeed uh, something that has to do with energy, probably oil or gas or, or these things. We're watching Russia bleeding when it comes to oil prices, when barrel is, uh, you know, uh, you know, ten dollars, and uh, Iran is bleeding, Russia is bleeding, Saudi Arabia, by the way, is bleeding as well. But unfortunately, even America is bleeding when it comes to prices that are that low. Um, the coronavirus is not helping here, but the the plunging uh, oil prices uh, were uh, were basically. Uh, you know, they were they were basically there um, even before, uh, but it's just that the coronavirus is is it made it even uh, worse. So, do you think that we're watching this thing right now? Well, yeah, I live in Oklahoma, and Oklahoma's bleeding too. That's one of our main industries is oil and gas. Actually, the day before yesterday, oil was negative twenty four dollars a barrel. They're having to you have to pay people to take it. I mean, there's you know, ships coming from Saudi Arabia, they, they're not going to let them uh, uh, make port here in the U.S. They have nowhere to put the oil. So, you know, there's no air travel right now. People aren't driving. I mean, there's just a massive glut of oil in the world, um, unlike anything we've ever seen, which is hurting these Middle Eastern nations. But, you know, at some point in time, everything's going to get going again in, in economies. There's going to be uh, all these countries that are pumping oil like crazy and draining their oil, Israel's really not using a lot of their resources right now, as far as I understand. I mean, they're not you know, pumping it out like Saudi Arabia and Russia and others are. So certainly the natural resources there in Russia or in uh, Israel could be the hooks in the jaws that bring, is bring Russia down. It also could be just Russia's alliance with Iran. You know, if, if Israel does strike Iran at some point in a preemptive strike to knock out their nuclear capability, you know, Iran at some point is going to want to lash back against that. If Iran is, and Russia are hooked together very tightly, that also could be, I think, a hook uh, that brings Russia to as well. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. It's uh, it's unbelievable to see that uh, uh, the plunging oil oil prices. I mean, I I kept reporting that a um, few times. Just a second. I kept re just a second, Mark. Um, I kept reporting that, um, but um, anyway, the idea is that um, the plunging oil prices are definitely a, a, a reason for a lot of uh, concerns over there. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, um, the... Um, and we're, we're moving now to the coronavirus because I know okay. that... Um, it's something that bothers too many people. Um, and there's a lot of conspiracy theory that is going on, and I'm sure you understand and you know that. Um, anyway, um, okay. Anyway, um, vaccine or no vaccine, how did we even get to, to that thing? Uh, I'm not even sure why we are there to to even talk about vaccination um, when uh, vaccination has been a controversial thing for the longest time. Um, so, what what what, what do you, why do you think we got to the point where the whole the whole discussion is on this? Well, I think what people want is everybody wants everything to get back to normal again. Large groups of people can gather international travel and all of that. And people see a vaccine or some type of cure, um, some type of antiviral that will kill the virus or a vaccine. 
as really the kind of the silver bullet, if you will, to get us back to where everything's normal. Because mm -hmm. as long as that virus is still hanging around out there and there's no cure for it and there's no vaccine for it, then there's kind of going to be this fear always that, you know, hey, it's going to erupt again. And we can never get back to normal and have people close together in large groups. So that's kind of seen as the ultimate, you know, um, to getting back to, to where we are at normal. I think that's why people are talking about that so much. Yeah. Personally, I'm not a, a big fan of vaccines uh, when it comes to something that is unnecessary, and especially when uh, we know that most people either uh, had it or will get it at some point and will not be affected by the coronavirus. Uh, this, this whole antibodies that already exist in way more people that were con uh, c confirmed as sick people. Um, we, we've seen that all over, um, uh, all around the world. But again, I, I don't think that vaccination is the story. I think that um, right now is, are we watching powers uh, that are trying to use this in order to push through other legislations and other th things that cause so many people to suspect that it is a very globalist, one world uh, thinking. Well, certainly, yeah. I remember Rahm Emanuel, who was the chief of staff for President Obama, said, you'll never let a good crisis go to waste. And uh, yeah, I think both sides do that, you know, in, in politics, you're going to try to seize upon a crisis because people let their guard down, they're desperate, and you can get things through. I mean, you know, we're spending money in America like it's, uh, you know, monopoly money right now. It's just, you know, trillions of dollars being spent on all kinds of different things. Um, but I think coronavirus to me has done two things as far as globalism. One is, is, is it, it has exposed the global society that we live in. Um, again, you know, we were over in Israel when this was happening. You're hearing about it there. They're shutting down. America's shutting down. No more travel from China. You know, one person got this virus in China, again, sometime probably last fall, maybe November. And it's gone around the whole world. It's in almost every country now. I think there's uh, yeah. 195 yeah. countries in the world. I think it's in about 190 of them. It just exposes the globalism, which you know, the Bible says we're going to have globalism in the end time. One man's going to rule the world politically, economically. But I think this is also accelerating globalism. You know, Gordon Brown, who's the prime, uh, former prime minister of England, um, a couple weeks ago said, you know, we need a global body. You know, we need an executive body, you know, to handle these kinds of things. So it's not only exposing what, how small our world is, but it's accelerating the globalism as well. But I think it can also break up a little bit of globalism because everybody right now is really mad at China. So there's going to be a fracturing, I think, as well, maybe of the world, even into to, to groups or uh, groups of nations, maybe more against one another than in any other time as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Before it will all go completely global, uh, we are still going to see a little fight here of the nationalists who would like to yeah. keep their national identity. Uh, I, I do want to tell you, though, that I've seen that in the U.S. and I, I, I saw it also today in New Zealand. Uh, uh, un under the auspices of the battle against the coronavirus, uh, legislations are being pushed uh, uh, pr predominantly to uh, fund and help and promote abortions. Um, I've seen that when Pelosi was trying to hide some some of those things in the stimulus package uh, deal in the first one that was approved. And thankfully, I think some of these things were uh, taken out. But uh, as of uh, this morning, uh, there was something very disturbing that I saw by the Prime Minister of New Zealand under the uh, the whole thing of coronavirus, um, while the con the country is completely shut down, um, we we are watching um, the most harsh um, uh, legislation for abortion that uh, we've ever seen before. Um, I, I, let me I believe that uh, I, I tweeted that today. And I have uh, I've got the the actual uh, the actual details. We're talking about abortion will now be available on demand for any reason up to birth. 
sex selective abortion will be legalized. The current 20 weeks limit for disability selective abortion will be scrapped and abortion will be available up to birth for disabilities, including cleft lip and club foot and Down syndrome. I mean, they are killing perfectly healthy people uh, who, who have maybe some minor issues and they are now, that's it. They don't deserve to live. There will be no requirement that a doctor must be involved with providing an abortion. There will be no legal requirement that babies born alive after a failed abortion are given medical support. I've never seen anything like that before. And uh, I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've read some legislations like the one in New York State and all of that. This is by far the harshest I've ever seen. And I'm not surprised that it came from a female uh, prime minister that also announced that uh, the whole country must listen to the call of prayer to of Islam uh, right after the Christchurch massacre uh, in that mosque. I mean, th there's some craziness that is going on there. And all of this right now is done while the country is in a lockdown due to the coronavirus. No, it's terrible. I mean, I have a, my oldest son. You mentioned my family earlier when you introduced me. Our oldest son was born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate, you know, and, um, you know, just for, for minor deformities like that. Yeah, we're going to we're going to kill people. This is you know, this is Joseph Mengele kind of stuff. You know, this is um, it, it's, it's the most uh, it, it, you run again out of adjectives for this. It's atrocious. It's barbaric. Yes. And uh, again, these are people that claim to be civilized. It's the worst form of barbarity. But again, under the, you know, under the, the guys, under the, you know, hidden underneath all of what's going on in the world, people are able to do a lot of things um, when they're, when there's crises that are going on. And, and most of what's being done is not good. Yeah. It's amazing it, though. It, yeah. It's like in second Timothy, you know, talks about in the last days, you know, people won't even have family love. You know, it's the word there's a storge. They don't even have the love that, a mother would have for a child. And again, that's just another sign that we see of just the brutality that's going to mark the end times. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, another thing is that, um, but I, I must admit, you know, I'm not a, I don't worship people. I don't admire and worship presidents. Uh, not at all. In fact, uh, I don't think there's a single politician that I admire to the point that everything he says or, 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 or does is is perfect. But I do have a, a an amazing uh, uh, I wouldn't call it admiration, but um, uh, appreciation to the way President. Trump surrounded himself with a lot of evangelical Christians uh, that are uh, allowing him to uh, hear uh, the voices of the conservatives in America that have been completely ignored uh, by the Democrats for so long. Um, and it, uh, it seems like a lot of um, dark things are coming to light right now. Uh, and many, many terrible things that have been done uh, in been practiced by so many of the elite uh, are being exposed right now. Um, I've watched a, an interesting uh, preaching or teaching of a, a person who talked about the Bible of President Trump. Have you have you seen this, the Donald's Bible or the Bible? Yes, I did see that video. Yes, yeah, fascinating. Fascinating, phenomenal to think that there is a Bible in the Oval Office that came all the way from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is, is Scotland, am I right? It was Scotland, um, and, yes. uh, Scotland, and uh, a Bible that was in a house of two uh, elderly ladies, uh, over 80, both of them, that were praying uh, for a revival many, many years ago in Scotland, and actually a revival did come, and uh, part of the revival had to do with a, a teenager called Donald there, that had nothing to do with uh, uh, President Trump, but uh, he obviously he could have been his grandfather. But of course, when President Trump's mother migrated to America, her, um, I think her fourth uh, baby was named after Donald. Uh, and uh, that same Donald from the revival. And of course, when, when she uh, gave birth, uh, when she got married, the Bible, 
that they had in that house was sent. And that Bible was given to President Trump by his mother. And that's the Bible he put his hand on when he uh, was pledging the allegiance to the United States in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, how do you call that uh, ceremony there? In, uh, inauguration, yeah. the inauguration. The inauguration, yeah. So to me, uh, I, it's a great sim symbolic thing, I think, that in the midst of so many ungodly things that Satan is trying to do, Satan likes to kill, steal, and, 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 and destroy, and killing babies is part of his, his masterpiece. I think that uh, to have a, 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 the leader of the free world having a Bible in his Oval Office a Bible that is coming out of a country and a time period where revival came. Do you foresee a revival uh, in the midst of all the craziness that is happening right now in America? Do you, do you see in, 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 in the near future a possible revival before a rapture out of here? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us that there will be one, but, you know, Greg Laurie, I know you've probably heard of Pastor Greg Laurie from California. He made a comment last week. He said, more people in America will probably watch services on this Easter than any Easter in history. And again, for the live stream, like at our church, we usually on an Easter Sunday, we'll have over 2,000 people or so. Uh, we, mm -hmm. had, uh, we had 3,200 devices. We probably had ten or 15,000 people watch our Easter service. Uh, I think that, and I've talked to a lot of my friends who are pastors. That's true everywhere. I think people, with what's happening, it's kind of like a wake up call. And people sense that you know, life is fragile and it's fleeting. And a lot of the things that people have trusted in and put their hope in, they realize now that they don't, they have no confidence in that. And so I think yeah. God can use what's happening to cause people to, you know, to flee to something that is solid and that will last forever. So it's a unique opportunity for the church. Um, for us to, to be ambassadors for Christ, to be faithful to him during this time, to have a sense of urgency. So I think, you know, God is certainly using it. I think a lot of people who weren't interested in spiritual things have, have kind of, or at least, at least have some interest or some uh, openness to that now. Yes. Uh, in fact, I've seen multiple images uh, from all across the world, from Brazil from India, from parts of Europe, there's a there was a, an unprecedented uh, prayer prayer meeting, online prayer meeting in Germany. That for the first time, the super conservative and the ultra charismatic churches all together came to pray. Um, um, and of course, um, I've been watching also in the parking lot of hospitals, uh, people coming to pray for the team inside inside hospitals. I've watched images of doctors and nurses praying. Um, and honestly, even Behold Israel as a ministry, we've never, ever had online presence the way we do now. I mean, we, we're reaching on Facebook alone over 10 million people, um, and we, we, we just never had it before. Uh, and so I do believe that the uh, new dimension of online ministry and online activity uh, has definitely added a lot uh, to uh, to that, but with that, of course, the danger is that uh, Satan is taking advantage of people's attention to the social media right now, and he's flooding it with a lot of garbage uh, as well. I, I'm, I'm, I can see that one. Now that's right. You know, there's a all this technology we have. God can use it, but certainly Satan is using it as well. So. Um, but, you know, yeah. we can't control all of that. All we can do is control our method, get our message out there and pray that God will take it and further it and use it for the glory. Mm -hmm. What do you say about uh, Macron? Uh, I've, I've seen the CNN, uh, uh, um, I guess, article about him positioning himself as a world leader. Um, you know, three years ago, uh, in May of 2017, he was elected as uh, the president of France. And uh, at that time, he was described as the savior of Europe. In fact, on The Economist magazine, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he was shown as uh, walking on water, uh, just like Jesus did. And uh, it said on it, is it Europe's savior or something like that? Well, it seems like the French didn't buy it. And for the last three years, 
France had deteriorated and the riots and the instability in France increased. But it seems also that the people behind him, that the globalist cabal that to begin with uh, had him uh, run, is trying uh, for the second time to build an image of Macron uh, uh, of, of a world leader. And he proposed to pardon all the debt of the poor African countries. Um, and of course, um, we're watching these things happening now. Now, personally, I, I, I don't think Macron is, uh, is something that can stand for the Antichrist uh, description, but I do believe with all of my heart that uh, Satan is trying. He's always trying. He's always trying to push. God knows everything. Satan does not know everything. And uh, he's always trying, always pushing. What, what do you have to say about this guy? Well, you know, gonna j just to kind of go off the last point you just made, Satan always has an Antichrist ready, I believe. You know, in every generation, Satan has someone who's ready because he doesn't know when the end times will come. So there's always an Antichrist who's alive on the earth somewhere. Now, whether he, that person becomes the Antichrist, you know, will depend on, on what takes place. But, you know, a guy like Macron, I mean, he's, uh, you know, kind of a, a handsome, sophisticated kind of guy, well-spoken. Um, kind of a soft-spoken type person. He's the kind of person, kind of very diplomatic seeming. He's the kind of person that appeals to our world today. You know, he's kind of the anti-Trump, I guess, if you would, in some ways, kind of an opposite of that. Um, again, you know, time will tell. But some some ruler, I think, will come out of the reunited Roman Empire someday um, who will, will lead the world. Um, yeah. And People like Macron, if you know, certainly he could be that person at some point in time, but they're a picture or a foreshadow of what that person will be like. But exactly. one thing I think it does show is people are looking for somebody. You know, the, the elites are trying to always push somebody in there. They want somebody to be the leader and, and to for the world to rally around them. And again, yeah. it's just that continued push that Satan has to globalism. Isn't that interesting that the French don't like him, but he's trying now to position himself as someone who is going to help the rest of the world and maybe the sympathy and the admiration of the rest of the world is going to cause the French to think, hmm, maybe we do have someone that good. I well, mean, that's right. I mean, politicians will use whatever they can, you know. I mean, again, you try to be popular in your own country so that the rest of the world will like you, but you can also do it the other way around. So, um yeah, I mean, he's a he's a guy that's very attractive to people, I think, globally, just because of his kind of calm, you know, diplomatic type of demeanor. But, um, yeah, I mean, he, it, may, it may increase his popularity uh, there at home. But Europe in general is in deep trouble right now. I mean, economically, you know, the tourism is dead. You know, there, yes. there, it's, there's a this whole this whole coronavirus it's got an, a, a, a um, you know certainly a health crisis, but the economic crisis that's coming behind it may even be worse. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it might even kill more people than the coronavirus itself. Well, it's I going to cause people to uh, want to. It's going to cause people to then to want to find somebody who can kind of rally the world, who can bring us out of it too. Correct, and it seems to me that um, uh, the EU as it is right now is not going to last. Uh, I think that a lot of countries in the EU realize that the EU is completely useless uh, when it comes to helping them. I mean, the, the European bank helped Iran faster than they helped Italy or Spain. And uh, I think that we're going to see a restructure of the EU that will eventually fit into the 10 horns of uh, Daniel's prophecy uh, that will eventually the, cause you know the Antichrist to come from. Uh, I also believe, just like you, that the Antichrist is going to come from the uh, territory of the former Roman Empire. I also want to remind everyone that once the old Roman Empire uh, stopped to, to exist when the Byzantines emerged, we, we know that uh, Germany became the uh, leader of the Holy Roman Empire that continued until 1800s, basically. I mean, uh, we have to remember that uh, the Germans and the French, are they have a significant role in, uh, 
in what used to be the Roman Empire then in up until not too long ago. And from some strange reason, and again, it's not something that I can put my finger on. I personally believe that it's we should keep our eyes on those two countries um, that are basically creating the biggest uh, and the wealthiest part of Europe, uh, the EU of today. So yeah, no, there's no, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I agree with that. Good. Listen, I th Mark, we we covered so much, and it's already uh, five forty-five uh, Israel time. Um, I is there anything that you would like in particular to to say to the people? We've got uh, thousands of thousands of people that are watching right now. Way over twelve thousand people watching right now. Is there any message that you want to give to people? And eventually, of course, hundreds of thousands are going to watch it. Well, you know, I think the one thing, the thing that's on people's mind most right now is this whole Corona crisis and what's going on with that. Um, at the risk here of, you know, shameless self-promotion, I've got a book that's coming out in about three weeks with Thomas Nelson. And the title of it is Corona Crisis, Plagues, Pandemics, and the Coming Apocalypse. If people want to know more about what's going on, kind of from a biblical perspective, um, you know, how this fits in with, the birth pains and Revelation chapter six and was this the judgment of God on us and all those kinds of things. We didn't, you know, we don't have to broadcast like this to get into all of that. And then what do we do? How do we how do we live in times like this? I cover all that. And so uh, I think, you know, hopefully people will find that helpful in these times in which we live. But you know, what I would say, um, you know, the most important thing obviously for all of us is to make sure we have a relationship with Christ. Um Amen. to make sure we know Amen. him and you know, the Look, we're, we're sinners. We need a Savior. Jesus is our Savior. We need to trust and believe in Him. Exactly. Someone's not done that. That's what they need to do. But mm -hmm. for those of us who are believers, um, I think we need to have a sense of urgency in our lives. We don't want to be fanatics. We don't want to be sensationalizers. But I think there's a godly, sanctified sense of urgency in our lives to be witnesses for Christ, to be faithful ambassadors for Him, and to make sure we're living our lives in a way that are pleasing to Him. Because I believe Jesus can come back at any moment. Um, I think yeah, I anytime. There's, there's nothing that has to happen for Jesus to come. And God didn't give us Bible prophecy to make us, uh, to scare us, but to prepare us and not to make us anxious, but to make us aware. And uh, we need to be aware. We need to be prepared uh, for the coming of the Lord. And, um, you know, ministries like yours are on the front lines of making that happen. And I appreciate very much what you're, what you're doing. Um, every time I see your name out there or see you speaking somewhere, or a new book you've come out with, um, it really uh, pleases me a lot, uh, the, the way God's using you. So, um, yeah, I hope people keep supporting you and your ministry. And, um, uh, you know, we're, together we, we can lock arms and we can be faithful. Um, Amen. Thank you, uh, Pastor Mark. I appreciate it. Um, again, Pastor Mark Hitchcock from Edmond, Oklahoma, the pastor of Faith Bible Church also um, a uh, professor in Dallas Theological Seminary. You can look him up on markhitchcock.com, am I right? Yeah, it's marklhitchcock.com, yes. marklhitchcock.com, yep. wonderful. So thank you again for being with me. I'm gonna conclude this broadcast with the ironic blessing that I want to impart on everyone uh, everywhere. And uh, we are all, um, in a great need to see God at work in our, everybody's life, but we really want uh, to see his face shining upon us and we need his grace and he will be gracious to us. So I'll say that prayer and that blessing in, in Hebrew and then in English. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. The peace that surpasses all understanding it can only come from the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, Jesus, who is the Lord of Peace that can give you peace now and forever and here and everywhere. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, everybody, for uh, staying with us. And uh, tomorrow I will be teaching you guys on Daniel 
uh, the Messiah in the book of Daniel. Uh, we are going to have a series of uh, teachings on the Messiah in the Old Testament, in the books of the Old Testament. I'm not going to be the only teacher. Several of other Israeli teachers will do the same, and we will post it on uh, on uh, Behold Israel. These are all going to be the speakers at the Awaiting His Return Bible Prophecy Conference in Jerusalem in November 2020. We, we believe that this conference and that tour will take place. Thank you. Again, thank you, Pastor Mark. God bless you. you all. And uh, shalom from Galilee, Israel.